Okay, everybody, I think we should get started here. Um, I'm Nita Couchman, the president of the Orcas Island Garden Club, and I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, welcome to our last official program of this season. Um, hopefully, we are going to be able to resume in person meetings in September. Um, as long as everything keeps going in the direction that we're going now, safety wise, that's gonna, we're, we're, we're hoping to be able to actually be together and see one another again before too long. Um, it's been a challenging year, but it's been actually a very productive and good year for the garden club. So thank you all for being part of that. Um, the other thing I just want to remind everybody of, this is our last presentation program, but June 26 and 27, uh, mark your calendar for the garden tour. We are going to have a fabulous garden tour this summer. Um, that will be our sort of our grand finale to, finale to see this season out. And then we're gonna sit back and enjoy our gardens and take a little breather until we start up again in September. So uh, watch for uh, information about buying tickets to the garden tour. If you feel like uh, volunteering to be a docent at one of the gardens on one of those days, you can contact uh, the garden club, Sally or Laura or me, any of us, and we'll, we'll hook you up with a, with a slot to help out. And, uh, now I'll turn the program over to Lena to introduce our speaker. Hello everyone. I'm, I'm just delighted to be able to introduce Katie Turi. She has um, done so much and many of you know her, um, probably most of you know her. Um, she provides support and leadership to gardeners in San Juan County in so many ways. Currently she's president of the San Juan County WSU Master Gardener Foundation. She has held leadership positions in our garden club and continues to provide mentoring to those of us who serve on the current board of OIGC. Kate Ituri is a San Juan County Master Gardener who aspires to improve her skills as an amateur entomologist and inspire others to advocate for insects. She has lived in Washington for 30 years and retired to Orcas Island nine years ago. She loves gardening in her edible and ornamental gardens, but especially enjoys identifying, observing, and protecting the insects who live there. For the best listening and viewing experience during the presentation, please mute yourself, turn off your video. It's down at the lower left in, on your screen. Also, please select speaker view. To ask questions or make comments, please use the chat feature. Holly King, our wonderful librarian, one of our wonderful librarians, will monitor chat and organize your questions. Kate will respond after each of the three sections of the presentation. So enter those questions or comments as you have them. Kate, I'm so delighted that you're here. Thank you. Thank you, Lena, and thank you, Program Committee, for inviting me. I'm excited about doing this because my goal is to give you the tools to identify the insects that you see in your garden and to protect the ones that are your friends, which is most of them. So um, that's, that's my goal, and I wish I could spread it worldwide so we could start appreciating insects rather than swatting them. So the first part of this is just going to be a general discussion of insects, just to give you the kind of information, some of which you might have, but that fascinates me. So insects, you probably know, are by far the most numerous and successful animals on earth. And there are 9 million different species of living creatures on earth, but most of them happen to be insects. At least 1 million different species of insects have been documented, but estimates of the total number range from five to 80 million, and it's probably closer to 80 than five. So one thing we don't always realize when we're swatting the insect is that only one to 3% of insects are really ever considered pests, which is defined as causing 
harm to people or the things that we care about, like plants, animals, and buildings. So that means that 97 to 99% of insects are absolutely not there to bug us, so to speak. So, you know, when we take that into consideration, it gives us a different perspective right away. These rot, you can see the picture of the robber fly. It looks really scary. It's big, almost an inch long, but they don't hurt us. They just eat lots and lots of insect pests. And we've got a lot of them on orcas. So I see them all the time. And then of course, mosquitoes, we all know they're pests, but they are significant pests. So you contrast the two and they don't look like as much of a pest as a robber fly, but they're the pest. They're so fascinating. This is a real grasshopper. <laughs> so this is the rainbow grasshopper and it's just so beautiful. Um, insects are diverse, they're social, they communicate with their behavior. They also com communicate with pheromones, uh, which are chemicals that they make and secrete. They're the source of honey, beeswax from bees, silk from silkworms, which is the larva of a butterfly, shellac from the lac bug, carmine red dye from the cochineal bug, ink from a gall wasp, and even, any, believe it or not, antibiotics from a leaf cutting ant. And they inspire so many things, aerospace, innovative music, energy efficient buildings, antifreeze, perfumes, and so much more. All of this information, and there's much more than this, comes from the book, Buzz, Bite, and Sting, which I think Laura Walker highlighted in the newsletter that came out this week. Um, it's, a, an, it's an amazing book. I've read it twice. I'll probably read it every year. It's just got so much information in it that it's kind of like um, the triumph of seeds that Tor Hansen wrote and that it's got so much information about insects rather than seeds that you never knew, It's just, or I never knew. So anyway, I hope it is in the library, so you can check it out. Insects can live in the most inhospitable places on, on earth from the Antarctic to the deserts of South America. They even live along the edges of the oceans. We don't believe they live in the ocean, but they do live along the edges. And this is an Arctic woolly bear moth that does live in the Arctic. They were around long before the dinosaurs arrived. This is an antlion larva, which some of you might've played with when you were children. They actually look like a dinosaur, which is why the picture is here. We know this because the oldest insect fossil was a set of jaws that goes back 400 million years, suggesting that insects were among the first animals to, to transition from sea to land. They're amazing with their eyesight in that they have compound eyes consisting, con, consisting of many individual ex, hexagonal units called amatidia. This allows them to see a panoramic 360 degree field of, of view, good for catching flying prey. And dragonflies are probably the best at that. They also have many ears. They're not usually on their heads. Lace wings have ears at the base of their wings. Crickets have sound sensitive membranes on their legs and grasshoppers ears are on their abdomens. Chan's megastick is the longest insect. It measures 22 inches long and is native to the island of Borneo. The heaviest insect is found in New Zealand. It's called the giant weta, and it looks like a giant cricket. It can weigh more than a pound. And then there's the tiniest, which is the fairy fly called, named after Tinkerbell, Tinkerbella nana, and it's from Costa Rica. This, is, this little tiny fairy fly is so small, less than a millimeter in length, that it could land on the tip of a human hair. Fascinating. The importance of insects. They pollinate three quarters of our food crops, a service worth as much as 500 billion a year. They pollinate wildflowering plants and that hasn't even been counted here. So this contributes to innumerable species that share the earth with us. By eat eating and being eaten, they also turn plants into protein and fuel the growth of countless other creatures and the animals, including us that eat them. They're essential to the breakdown and recycling of all the waste of the earth, keeping soil, water, air clean and all the ecosystems within them healthy and so much more. We don't, we simply don't know everything that they do. But, and you probably all know this, we are losing insect populations at an exponential rate. 
Scientists differ as to the cause and causes, but there are probably many. Um, they also differ as to the severity, but agree this is real and happening much more quickly than we would ever expect. This is a New York Times article from 2018, which, which is a start if you wanna read about this, but you probably have, it's been all over the popular media. So some more general, less fascinating, but you need to know them to identify insects. Insects have segmented bodies, jointed legs, and an external skeleton called an exoskeleton. So that is an insect. They are distinguished from other arthropods like spiders by their body, which is divided into three major regions, their head, their thorax, and their abdomen. The head bears the mouth parts, the eyes, and a pair of antennae. The thorax, which usually has three pairs of legs in adults and two, one or two pairs of wings is, has three segments. And the many segmented abdomen contains the digestive, excretory and reproductive organs. These are just names, you may already know them that you will need to know when you identify insects. These are just the common parts of the body. There are a jillion other names, but I think these are the ones that you need to know. You don't, don't need to know all the other technical parts for the small parts of the insect body. So one of the more important um, things to know about insects, and thanks to Lena for insisting that this be in here, she's right. Insects have to go through cycles to be able to grow because of their exoskeleton. It must be shed and another one formed for them to grow. So we need to know the, the intermediary insect, the larva, in order to understand what's good and what's bad in our garden. There are two different ways that insects change their form and grow, incomplete or simple metamorphosis and complete or complex metamorphosis. Simple, just as you can see in this picture is, and I'm gonna go forward here, it's just, a system where they have three different stages. They have an egg, a nymph, and an adult. And the nymph resembles a miniature adult, but is not able to produce young. And there may be multiple, what are called instars, different types or of nymphs in between, but they're all generally the same in appearance. They still may be different looking from the adult final adult, but they are much easier to identify as say, a larva of a true bug than a butterfly and a caterpillar are. This is seen in various insects, including dragonflies, grasshoppers, earwigs, cockroaches, and true bugs. And as I said, they're, they're less difficult to differentiate from their adults than the insects that go through complete metamorphosis. Complete or complex metamorphosis, insects grow through four stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. The caterpillar, which often we kill in our gardens, is the growth phase. And the importance of this is that those caterpillars that are voraciously eating our plants are probably butterflies or moths. The pupa, that they turn into after they do all this eating is the phase during which everything grows, their internal organs are differentiated, and this is called the resting stage. And once this stage is complete, the fully formed adult is ready to emerge. So you can see this cicada, and those are all over the news, just climbs out of its nymph as a fully formed adult. However, this butterfly is climbing out of its chrysalis or pupa after going through the phase of the caterpillar. So we can now um, go ahead, if there are questions about that first section, I can try to answer them. Are there any questions, Holly? Kate, I have not seen anything come through the chat. Oh, okay. okay, so we'll move on. So most insects, as I stated before, are beneficial as pollinators, predators, or even as parasites of other pest insects. 
And we all know these insects, ladybugs, bumblebees, parasitic wasps, butterflies, many, many, many others. They may be predators to insect pests or play an important role in pollination or live off pest insects. And the strategies for attracting and keeping them in your garden are pretty straightforward. Avoid all pesticides, reduce your lawn, plant a diverse collection of plants and flowers and create a natural riparian environment with fallen leaves, water and native plants to encourage them to stay. Pest insects are less common and most of these don't occur in numbers that do a lot of damage and can be tolerated in the garden. There are some that do and we're gonna go over those but most of them don't. They're most likely to be attracted to diseased or unhealthy plants, usually plants that are in the wrong place. The master gardener mantra, which is right, right place, right plant. When damage is noted and insect activity is suspected, what master gardeners recommend is practicing integrated pest management. And that always begins with identifying the pest, which is sometimes not very easy because you don't see the pest, you just see the damage but you may see the pest somewhere else in your garden. So try to identify whatever you think is causing the pest, causing the damage, and then decide how many of those pest insects are tolerable because the, the predators actually need to feed off something. So you need some of them there and some plant damage is natural. I'm sure all of you note in the, in the summertime that your roses and leaves and some of the other thin leaves in your garden have little notches on the edges of them. And some of you may know that that's due to leaf cutter bees, which are really essential native pollinators. Um, so a lot of us are offended by that, but actually it indicates that we have a really healthy garden that nurtures insects. So it's a good thing. The other, once you figure out what insect is doing it and how many you can put up with, then think about using alternative control methods, um, changing the environment, moving the plant away, whatever. Um, it may take a little while for the predators to make a difference, but if you have to use insecticides, and I strongly urge you not to, make sure they only kill that specific pest. So these, I don't know if you guys know what these three larvae are, but the one on the left um, is the larva of a ladybug. The one in the right top is of the larva of a surfid fly. And then the one on the right side is in the right lower side is a tree hopper larva. So these are all actually predators and we want them in our garden. But if we kill these funny looking larvae, we've basically killed the adult. So now we're gonna go through some common insect orders, the different families, so that you can tell the difference when you go to identify. I'm also gonna to touch on the common pests that we see, primarily in Washington. So the first order we're gonna look at is the order Coleoptera, which are beetles. And there are a zillion beetles and they're gorgeous. Um, just a few of them are listed here. Ground beetles, longhorn beetles, leaf beetles, ladybird beetles, firefly beetles, stag beetles, but there's many, many, many others. They go through com complex metamorphosis. So they go through the whole thing. They live in many different habitat, habitats, aquatic, terrestrial, and underground, and they chew their diet, which can include rotting wood, dung, carrion, other animals, and of course, plants. Most of them are predators. Not all of them, but most of them are, and most of them are our friends. Here's just a few that we could see up here. Um, probably all of you have seen this golden buprested. It's pretty common. They get... Um, given to us in the Master Gardener uh, Diagnostic Clinic all the time. They're really gorgeous. So pests, the asparagus beetle is a pest. There are two species. They're both about a quarter inch in size. One is blue, black with yellow and red markings. And the other one is orange, red with black spots. They distort spears by eating tender heads. You may never see them, but you may find what they do to your asparagus. And then you can hunt for these because they're big enough to see with the naked eye. Western spotted cucumber beetle. 
These are also a significant pest. They have a quarter inch black body and yellow ring wings that are spotted black and they're very attractive, but they feed on leaves and larva, feed on the roots of cucumber plants. Flea beetle, you guys have probably all at least seen the activity of this little pest. It's about a 1 16th inch size pest. It's brown to metallic black and it jumps like a flea when it's disturbed. It, it generally loves your spinach and your lettuce and jumps around making little small round holes in your uh, leaves. It, the larvae also feed on the underground portions of the plants, but what you notice is all the little holes. And then there's the Japanese beetle, which have been recently identified in Washington. I think the closest county to us that they've been seen in is Snohomish. We've not seen them here in the San Juans, but they're probably coming. And these are really nasty um, pest beetles. They're just under a half inch in size. They're really very attractive. They're iridescent green with brown wings. And then they have these little white spots along the sides of their body, which are actually little tufts of hair. And they are significant pests in all of their life stages. The grubs eat grass roots and the flying adults eat almost everything. They love roses, they eat fruit, they eat flowers. So um, they're very common in the Northeast. And I believe the Midwest also has a significant number of them. So it's too bad that we've got them now. If you see one, please contact the extension, the San Juan County Extension and let them know and they'll tell you how to report it. Um, if, you, if you think you saw one and you can actually catch it and put it in a jar, let them know and then they can actually confirm that. So the next group after beetles are true bugs, order Hemiptera. And these are really cool bugs too. They're gorgeous. They're ambush bugs, assassin bugs, stink bugs are probably the ones we think of the most, squash bugs, seed bugs, and then cicadas are a subgroup of Hemiptera. And all of you have been hearing about probably too much, the cicadas that are going to be attacking us momentarily, which I think is cool. I grew up where my brothers and I caught cicadas on trees as they climbed out of the ground in their larva state. And then we watched them as they molted out of their exoskeleton. I always thought it was very cool. So this is a little minute pirate bug. And if you notice, he's she's eating aphids. So doing a good job there for us. This is a pretty small true bug. True bugs go through simple metamorphosis, not complex, and they have, and this is really important, they have piercing sucking mouth parts, which distinguishes them from the insect that they're most confused with, and that's beetles. Beetles chew, these guys suck. So this, include, this order includes many predators, but also some pests. And unfortunately, some of the pests primarily are pests because they spread diseases like viruses because they suck juices from one plant, pick up a virus and then spread it to another plant. So these are some gorgeous true bugs. The ambush bug to me, I've never seen one. Um, they almost look prehistoric. So true bug pests, aphids, we all know aphids. We see them every year on our brassicas and a lot of other things. They can be many different colors and they almost always have a specific host plant. They're very, very small, 1 16th inch, sometimes smaller. They can be winged or wingless and they produce honeydew, that sticky um, substance that gets on your leaves that you have to clean off because then it gets sooty mold. Ants love to, to basically harvest it. So that's what you're seeing when you're seeing ants on your plants. They're actually probably harvesting the honeydew of aphids they suck the plant juices of their host plants. So that's how they are pests. And here's another nasty bug, which I do not think we have in the San Juans yet. Um, if anybody knows otherwise, please correct me later. The brown marmorated stink bug is from Asia. Um, it looks so much like so many of our regular stink bugs that it's kind of scary because people are probably killing a lot of these that aren't the brown marmorated. It's a very significant 
pest. Um, it, it spreads rapidly, it loves fruit. So for fruit growers, it's, it's a disaster. But the way you can tell the difference, and it's actually, it's actually pretty easy because they're not that small. They have marbled legs and then, and you can see it in this picture and they have white bands. And I think this is the easiest to see on their antenna. And so there are these brown stink bugs are really, really common, but this is the only one that has these kind of striped antenna. So here's the, the part that you'll probably want to refer to later. Um, how to distinguish between beetles and true bugs. Beetles have round oval body shapes, but so do bugs, except that they can also have kind of shield shaped bodies. Beetles have hard leathery forewings and thinner hidden hind wings. Bugs, true bugs have two sets of wings and the forewings are often thickened, but the hind wings are membranous and they are seen. In the beetle, you don't actually see them. But what I find easier to, to use to tell the difference is that the, the elytra, which are the wing covers, in a beetle, they make a they meet in the middle, so they make a straight line down the back or the abdomen of the beetle, whereas the bugs form a large X. So you can see in this milkweed bug, there's kind of an X on the back where the, where the medial edge um, of the wings come together. They both have visible antenna, but the beetles have much longer antenna than the bugs. And, excuse me, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> and most importantly, most importantly, their mouth parts are different. So beetles have a mandible that looks like it could chew. It looks like a jaw. But bugs have a long proboscis that generally goes down between their legs toward their abdomen. And that's what they use to suck the juices of the plant. And you can see it in, in this picture. I believe it's in between the antenna kind of going down off the head of the of the bug, of the milkweed bud. So that is probably the wing shape on the bat, on the abdomen and being either together straight line or an X and the mouth parts are how I usually distinguish between beetles and true bugs. So now we're gonna go through flies. And as you know, flies, are very common and there's lots of them. Um, crane flies, flower surfer flies, which are beneficial and very common, fruit flies, house flies, parasitic flies, and there are many others. They mature through complex metamorphosis and their habitats are infinitely diverse. Flower flies or surfid, I need to get rid of this, are the largest group of pollinators. Sorry, Judy is my assistant, actually my mentor. Just keep going. <laughs> He's assisting me. So here's some pictures. Um, this is a this is a surfeit or flower fly up in the top. And you guys have probably seen this a zillion times. They kind of look like bees or wasps and that so that birds don't eat them. Okay. Um, we're having a little bit of trouble with, I'm using Judy's computer because my computer wasn't cooperating. So I'm having a hard time here with the computer. So bear with me. Um, so anyway, the way you can tell the difference between a surfeit fly and wasps and bees is that they hover over, they really hover like a helicopter over the flowers that they're visiting. And they're they're generally smaller, but not always. But they they have two they have one pair of wings, only two wings, not four, like a true bee or wasp. And then the tachinid fly that you see in the left lower corner, this is the fly, the parasitic fly that actually um, lays its its eggs in the head of a western tent caterpillar. 
And if y'all recall, when we had that horrible tent caterpillar um, invasion, I think it was like 12 to 14, 2012 to 2014, you weren't supposed to bug them if you saw the little white spot on their head. And that's what that was. Once this lar this egg hatches, the larva literally eats the, sorry, eats the um, fly from the inside out. And then there's that robber fly. So that's the same guy that we talked about earlier that's big and ugly, but doesn't hurt you at all. Okay. So some flies that are actual pests, the carrot rust fly, you've probably seen in your garden. It's a shiny, dark green, small quarter inch fly. It has yellow legs, which are pretty distinctive and pretty easily seen. Its larva is a significant pest of carrots. They, um, the flies lay their eggs around the crown of the plant and when they hatch, the maggots burrow into the roots, causing the fruit to be damaged and the leaves to yellow and become stunted and die. The larva are about a half inch long and yellowish tan. And you might see them, but you're more likely to see the carrot rust fly flying around laying their eggs. And then the dreaded spotted wing Drosophila, which we figured out we had a lot of because one of the master gardeners, who's also a garden club member, Julia, trapped a zillion of them and ID'd them for us. Um, these are nasty pests that get into our small fruit, anything that has thin skin like blueberries, strawberries, blackberries, cherries, and lay their eggs. And then when the lay eggs hatch into a lot of little larvae, you've got mushy fruit. It's about eight, an eighth inch in length, so very small, tan body, red eyes, which you may not notice, but it had they, the males have a single spot on the edge of the wings near the tip. You can see it here, and that's where they get their names. The females also have a long ovipositor where they deposit the eggs into the, into the fruit. So you might see that as well, but you can trap them. This is information actually from Julia. Um, this is how you make a spotted fruit fly trap. And some of you may already be doing this, but it's probably a good idea to do this near your blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, other fruit. Um, you just use a clear plastic cup or a deli container, 16 ounce plastic cup that you see here is ideal. Punch seven to 10 holes measuring an eighth to three sixteenths inch around the top edge of the cup. And the flies will actually enter the trap through those holes. Leave a three inch section on one side of the container so you can pour out the used vinegar. And then you add one inch of pure apple cider vinegar and then one to two drops of unscented dish soap. Snap the lid in place and then put tape over any openings where the rainwater might come, uh, come into the cup. And then you hang them nearby and uh, raspberries and blueberries, you can hang it on a stake or a plant or a trellis three to five feet above the ground, um, pick a shady or cooler side of the, of the plant area, and then strawberries, you can actually put it on the ground or elevated slightly. And you should put the traps out as soon as you see fruit um, being set. So it's there so that you catch as many as you can so they don't get into your fruit. You can also net your fruit, of course, and you should do that to keep them off of it, but they're tiny, they sneak in. So now wasps, ants, and bees, one of our favorite groups of insects, order Hymenoptera. These include ants, bumblebees, native solitary bees, of course, European honeybees, symbicid sawflies, which are the big sawflies you see flying around right now on your maple trees, digger wasps, skull wasps, horntails. There's a lot of different bees and wasps and ants. These insects, um, go through complex metamorphosis, the whole thing. They, um, many of them are diverse. Many of them are social, they're all diverse. So bees and wasps, ants and sawflies are um, often social. They build communities whose individuals communicate with each other in multiple, multiple ways and their habitats are diverse. They pollinate um, as they feed on, on nectar, but they also, are great predators, and many of them are parasitoids as well as we've already, as we've already discussed. And they're gorgeous and so fun to watch. 
So just some pictures of common Hymenoptera. Probably all of you know that those gorgeous um, little round balls that get in your <clears throat> native rose bushes are made by a gall wasp who lays their eggs inside of these beautiful puff balls with spikes on them. Sweat bees, I think Tor Hansen told us a lot about these when he spoke. They're really cool, iridescent green and gorgeous. They're solitary native bees. White-faced hornet, which look fierce and can sting, but generally don't unless you really aggravate them. They make those gorgeous basketball-sized um, nests that we see sometimes in the forest. And they can be on your house, but they're more likely to be in trees than in the forest. And then California horntails which are also buzzing around right now when the sun's shining. So pests that are Hymenoptera. I always have trouble with yellow jackets because they are predators that are eat so many aphids, at least in my garden, but they also have a really nasty sting. So I've always called them our friends, but some of my master gardener friends, including Junie, reminded me that they sting and they're really not entirely good friends. Everybody knows what they look like and probably everybody knows that they're especially aggressive in the late summer, August, September, and they'll always sting when disturbed, but they eat lots and lots of pests. And if you notice um, mid to late summer, they're usually all over plants that have aphids on them. So they, you know, they really, they really are good predators, but you have to decide whether you want them in your garden or not. And here's the one that's been all over the news, um, the Asian giant hornet. So this hornet, as you probably all know, has been found in Washington state. The sightings are mostly in, in the Northwest corner at the Canadian border near Blaine. There was one sighting in Bellingham. There have been at least one, uh, there's been at least one large nest dismantled by the group that included Chris Looney, who's spoken at some of our master gardener workshops um, was a part of, but they really are very different looking than almost every, than all other Hymenoptera. Lots of people have thought that they spotted them and actually killed insects that they then sent up into the WSDA for identification and confirmation. And they, they by and large are not Asian giant, giant hornets. Um, there are a lot of big Hymenoptera, um, but this one is really big. It's two inches in length, which is huge. You can see the comparison. Um, but the, I think the most distinctive thing about this hornet is its orange head. There, to my knowledge, there is not another um, Hymenoptera that has an orange head and you can see it in the photo. It is orange. So if you see one of these, obviously, some of us are doing traps on the island to see if we see any here. I think Tony might be, um, but I don't think anybody's caught any Asian giant hornets, thank goodness. If you need more information, you can go to this website to read about them. It's really pretty. There's actually even a, a YouTube video as to how to identify them if you're really interested in that. So how to distinguish between flies and bees and wasps. Um, flies have large round eyes that almost completely cover their face. Bees and wasps have kind of long oval eyes and they're on the side of their face. Flies have short antenna that you almost always cannot see. Um, bees and wasps have long, easy to see antenna, often with a kink or an elbow. Flies look short and stout. They don't really have a waist. And then bees, wasps have an hourglass body shape with a waist and cylindrical thorax and abdomen. Flies have a large head and um, bees and wasps have more of a teardrop, less round and smaller head. And big difference here, flies have one pair, two wings, and bees and wasps have two pairs, four wings. So Usually it's fairly easy to tell the difference, but they move fast. So <laughs> um, if you could slow them down, you could always tell the difference, but those are just some clues that you can use to tell the difference. Leafhoppers, cicadas, and their allies. These are just beautiful insects that, that are both predators and pests. They're just absolutely gorgeous. 
um, they're works of art. It's just amazing that they're insects. They mature through simple metamorphosis and they eat plants. They also eat insects. And unfortunately, they also, they're a suborder of hemiptera, so they are sucking insects so they can spread diseases. And actually cicadas are in, as stated, are in this group and they're the ones that are in the news right now. Here are some in that class. And they're, I don't know what you think, but I think they're gorgeous. And so different looking. Butterflies and moths, probably many of our favorite order of insects, Lepidoptera. So they're beautiful, they're iconic, they fascinate us, they mature through complex metamorphosis as we all know. And they're, but the thing to remember is their larvae are caterpillars, the voracious chewer of all of our plants. But we need to tolerate and protect caterpillars because otherwise they're not, butterflies are not gonna continue to grace our gardens and do the pollination work that they do, which is, which is less than what bees and wasps do, but it still is an important part of pollination. And more than that, what would we do without butterflies? So many butterflies, so many moths, there's no way you can identify them all. Um, but here are some that we commonly see here and a couple of endangered, the anise swallowtail, I saw one this morning, um, even though it's raining, and the, the great um, spangled fritillary. We often see this early spring as well. And then here are two that are endangered. The, I don't know if any of you all have seen an uh, island marble mutter, butterfly, but it is endangered and it's in the San Juan County. So um, if you ever see one, you're lucky. And then the endangered sheep moth, which is also a beautiful moth. And it also is in the San Juans and endangered. This is a very important moth, the cinnabar moth and its gorgeous larva. These are the, the larva that feed on invasive tansy ragwort. And if you leave the ragwort going, when you see these caterpillars, they'll do a good job of getting rid of it. Um, so I've had this experience in my own neighborhood um, where we used to pull all the tansy, but then finally one year they were covered with the caterpillars. So we left it alone and now we rarely see the tansy. They really did a good job. Here's more larva. You can see that, you know, they don't look like their parents try to identify them. And these guys move slow, so they're way easier to identify before you kill them. And most of them do not hurt you. So you can pick them up. You may not want to, but you can scoot them into a jar or whatever. They're not gonna hurt you. The imported cabbage butterfly is our one butterfly pest. You guys have probably all seen this on your brassicas. It's a small butterfly with a wingspan of about an inch that has black spots on its forewings. I've already seen them in my garden, but my brassicas are covered with, re, with a row cover so they can't get in. It lays its eggs on the underside of brassica leaves and then they hatch and the, the uh, caterpillar look like this, this one on the right, but they start out pretty small and they kind of blend in with the leaf. So they are hard to see. But as they get bigger, you can see them. What I see first usually when I used to not cover my brassicas was the frass, the excrement that could be seen all over the leaves along with the irregular holes, of course. And unfortunately three to five generations can occur in a season. So that's a lot. Um, I, when I, before I covered my brassicas, I went out one day and found three large heads of broccoli gone. So they can do some major damage. So I would encourage you to either cover your brassicas or go out every single day and look for the caterpillars. And then here's the one we all know about, the Western tent caterpillar. Um, I don't even need to describe it. We all know what it looks like. They attack almost everything and they occur in epidemic-like cycles. Um, I have never read how many years there are between the epidemics, but they're usually you know, upwards of seven to 10 years. We had the epidemic that we had in 12 to 14. So it's hopefully gonna be a while before we see them again, but they are not fun. So how to distinguish between a butterfly and a moth. Butterflies have tent shaped wings. They hold them high above their body and moths generally have wings that they hold flat, which that's a pretty easy thing to, to distinguish. 
the butterflies have an antenna with a knob at the end and moths have kind of a feathery simple antenna ending in a fine point. Butterflies generally fly during the day and are more brightly colored and moths are usually more iridescent or dull color, although you couldn't tell that from the sheep moth and they generally fly it at night. And then here's some more important to gardeners, insects, neuroptera or lace wings and snake flies. Um, there's that ant lion I told you about, which is the larva of a lace wing. And they go through simple metamorphosis. The, the nymphs are, are very good predators. And then dragonflies and damselflies, major predators and absolutely gorgeous. Some of the ones we see here. Most of my pictures come from um, Wikipedia and uh, Flickr Commons. So I didn't take most of these and they're gorgeous. So if you need photos, that's a place to look. It's amazing how people are willing to share their gorgeous photos. So dragonflies have an amazing vision and multi-directional flight. They can stop and switch directions midair and captivate us with their beauty. They are absolutely gorgeous. Um, they eat, they're generalists, so they eat everything. They may eat beneficial insects, but they do more harm than good and they eat a lot of mosquitoes. They grow through simple metamorphosis. Their immature um, nymph is aquatic. And I don't know if y'all, you guys read or heard this report about this rescue drone that was just developed to go into um, mines and caves to rescue people. Um, it was based and modeled on the flight. Um, the drone was based on the flight of the dragonfly, which I find fascinating. Earwigs, another, another insect like the wasp, the yellow jacket that I'm, I hesitate to call a pest. Um, we all know what they look like. They go through simple metamorphosis. They eat everything. They also eat my dahlia petals and leaves. And, you know, I'm sure they do the same in your yard, but they eat a lot of pests as well. So they're thought to do more harm than good. Grasshoppers, crickets, katydids, orthoptera is the order. These guys generally are pests, um, although they're fun to watch. They go through simple metamorphosis. And this is the red-legged grasshopper or locust. And we get these um, some years, I don't see them every summer, but we do, they like uh, lower altitudes, moist ground, feed on pretty much everything. And I think there was just a, I don't know that it was the red-legged grasshopper, but a locust um, epidemic or whatever you wanna call it in uh, Africa, if I'm not mistaken, that did a lot of damage. So non-insect arthropods, in other words, these are not insects, but they're of interest to gardeners. Spiders and mites, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, they're in the class Arachnina, Arachnina, and they're voracious, spiders are voracious predators. And contrary to urban lore, they rarely bite humans. Uh, mites are really small, 1 50th of an inch. They're pale to brownish in color, and they're often predators, but they also can be pests. Millipedes, slow moving, round, many le legged arthropods you probably see in your garden, but they, they really are not pests. They feed on fungi and decaying plants. Centipedes, they look like millipedes, but they're kind of flat and they have fewer legs and they run fast and they are voracious predators as well. And I think there are a couple of centipede um, species that can uh, actually bite, but I've never heard of anybody been bitten by a centipede. Sow bugs and pill bugs, we often think that they're, they're pests, but they're not. They mostly feed on decaying organic matter. They're often seen in compost. They rarely eat healthy plants. And they are in the class crustacea. So they're related to shrimp and crabs. And then the class Symphyla um, includes a small, um, a very tiny centipede-like creature that are often called garden centipedes. They live in soil and they can cause significant damage to roots, but it tends to be sporadic. I don't know if anybody's had any experience with them, um, but I have not. Why spiders are important. Um, spiders are amazing pest 
control. There are over 800 species of all sizes in Washington and probably about 25 in your average pesticide free garden. Venomous spiders that are considered medically important in Washington include the black widow and the yellow sack spider. That's all. Hobo spiders are, are not thought to cause dangerous bites. We used to think they did, but increasing evidence shows us that they don't. And brown recluse spiders, contrary to what your healthcare provider may tell you, don't live in our state. I think the closest they live is in Nebraska, Western Nebraska. So brown recluse do not hang out in Washington, west side or east side. Black widow, yellow sack, and hobo spiders live outdoors, but they can occasionally find their way inside homes. And there have been black widows found on San Juan. I don't know of any found here on Orcas, but I know that there were quite a few that were found in one area on San Juan. Yellow sacks I see all the time in my garden. So I don't know if you do too. They We had a picture of them back um, earlier in the, in the uh, presentation, but they look like what their name is. The bites are rare simply because the biting part of the spider is on the underside of their head. So in order to bite, literally on the underside, not on the end of their, their head, but on the underside. So for them to bite you, they have to be squished against you. Um, so they just don't bite that often. <laughs> So if you if you want to read more about spiders, you can go to the Burke Museum's Spider Facts site. It's got lots and lots of information about spiders that's fascinating. And then harvestmen, otherwise known as daddy long legs, are not even really spiders. They, are, they have a little tiny body, body, a quarter of an inch, but they have those really long legs and they hang out in your shower or where else. They're often in your, your house, but they don't even have the ability to bite you. They're, they're, they don't have a mouth that is able to bite. So they're also not dangerous. They're, they might be scary, but they're not dangerous. Then slugs that we all hate, they're not insects either. They're not even arthropods. They're in the phylum mollusca and the class gastropoda. They're more closely related to an octopus than an insect. So they're not bugs. So how to attract well, we can stop there. Any questions? That's a lot of information. Any questions about all of that information? Holly? Yes, quite a few. Okay. So, um, I'm going to scroll back up. So a uh, couple of comments. Uh, the first comment is that the marmorated stink bug is all over King County. Oops, yeah. hold on. I got to mute something. <laughs> Wait. Okay. Okay. Um, and I don't know if you knew that or not. Yes, I do know it's in King County, but it's okay. we don't we don't know that it's here yet. That's why I'm saying we need to pay attention. Okay. Uh, the next question, the first question is: Are flies beneficial? You mean regular house? Does a person mean regular house flies? I, I would guess yes. If if the person who asked that question wants to clarify, um, they can do so in the chat. But I'm guessing yes. Yes, houseflies are major uh, composters. <laughs> they break down all kinds of things. They, they also are used in, in medical uh, ways. So they're, not, you know, they, are, they're, they bother us and, you know, we don't want to see them. We don't want to see their larva, but in general, they're breaking down um, our, the detritus of our life. So they're, I, I consider them beneficial. Okay. Um, to each her own. Uh, <laughs> the next comment is, I just saw a tent caterpillar nest in an alder a few days ago. Oh, no. We, we always have some. So don't assume that we're going to have the big ex population explosion because we have some every year. And you, you guys probably all know that you also, they, they, their egg cases are those kind of brown styrofoamy like um, tubular structures that get on trees and branches. And you can remove those and uh, get rid of them well uh, by probably burning them um, and prevent the, the, uh, the tents. But we have some every year, just like the fall webworm. We tend to have them every year, but that doesn't mean we're gonna have a, an explosion of their population. So okay. fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, the next is a multi-part question. 
Uh, in referring to dragonflies and earwigs, you said they do more harm than good. Did you mean it the other way around or should Oh, we... I'm sorry. I meant it the other way around. I'm okay. sorry. Dragonflies, definitely. Earwigs are the one that I'm, you know, they do more good than harm. <laughs> All right. And what eats the leaf edges of the rhododendrons? Oh, um, dadgummit. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, those are, we just had one at the clinic. Uh, Tony, Julia, help me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you want to come back to it? Yeah. Okay. Or they can, those two took the sample the other day, so they can type in the answer. I'm yeah. having a, a brain, whatever. Julia says they're root weevils. Thank you, Julia. Yes, they're root weevils. Okay. Uh, next question is, what do cutworms become in adult form? They become moths. Okay. All right. The next one is about dragonflies, but I think you answered that because they really are good, not harmful. They're all good. They're all good. There's nothing really, I mean, they eat a lot of insects, so they eat, they eat predators too, but they eat okay. more pests than predators. The dragonflies like to come in the library, which really? I find. Yes. Wow. Um, okay. Last question. What do fall army worms become as adults? Fall army worms. I am not familiar with fall army worms, so I don't okay. know. Okay. All right. That's all the questions I have right now in the chat. Great. Thanks, Holly. Good thing. All right, we're, we're almost done. So how to attract pollinators since these are the insects we really want in our garden, even though we want all of them, we really want pollinators. Provide a range of plants that offer a succession of flowers and thus pollen and nectar throughout the whole growing season, which is relatively easy to do in the Northwest because of our mild maritime cli climate here. So just figure it out and make sure you've got something blooming all the time, which you'll enjoy too. Native plants seem to be better at this. Um, there's a lot of research and more information coming out lately that native plants are more attractive, um, especially to native bees than exotic or non-native flowers. They're, you know, don't go and rip out all your, or your non-native ornamentals, they're good too. But, you know, if you like natives, buy them, put them in, they tend to thrive and they tend to be better at attracting pollinators. Choose lots of different colors of flowers. Um, that's attractive to, you know, bees have different preferences, different types of bees, but they're particularly all attracted to blue, purple, violet, white, yellow. Um, and then something that I didn't realize until I started reading about this, um, they recommend that you plant these flowers in clumps rather than scattered throughout because they will be more of a beacon to the insects. Um, and if space allows at least four feet or more in diameter, that's that's pretty big for each clump. And then include flowers with different shapes and sizes because different, different creatures, different insects have different needs in terms of reaching the nectar in those flowers and a diverse mix. And then how to design the landscape so that it nurtures them. So you're attracting them in, but then you want them to stick around and so probably the most important thing to do is to leave some mess in your yard, which is relatively easy to do on Orcas and on other San Juan Islands. Um, but, you, you know, undisturbed places for hibernation and overwintering, places where there's mud and sand and dirt that's exposed and not covered by mulch for native bees to dig into because they're mostly in the ground more of an untidy environment. And then once again, the diversity of native plants whose blooming times overlap. And then I know you're getting tired of it, but no pesticides, if you can avoid them, please do. And then tools that you need to go out into your garden and look at your insects to be able to identify them. I have to be honest and say that the most valuable thing to me is a white, yogurt cup and its top. And because against white, I can see the insect better and I can often 
even without a net, although a net is really helpful, I can capture them and put them in the yogurt cup and not hurt them and then take them in the house. And if, if I can't see them well without slowing them down, I put them in the freezer for a short time, which doesn't kill them. It just slows them down so that then you can take them out in 10 to 15, 20 minutes and look at them. Um, and then maybe you'll need some tools like tweezers to handle the insects. And then you'll probably need some way to magnify the insect. The easiest thing to get is a hand lens with a light and there are a zillion of them on the internet that you can order. Um, there also are small uh, stereoscope microscopes that you can plug into a laptop that allow you to see insects up close. And then you can actually go all out and get a stereoscope, uh, like a microscope, but a stereoscope, larger stuff um, that allows you to look at the insect. But most of the time, I just use a hand lens because I'm out in the garden working. And so I want to do it out there. So I use the yogurt cup and the hand lens and can usually narrow at least it down and take a picture of it so that then I can go inside and do more research. iPhones come in handy. Recommended insect guides for the Pacific Northwest. Um, probably the one that I recommend the most is the one that I think someone won in the Garden Club, the Pacific Northwest Insects by Merrill Peterson um, from the Seattle Audubon Society. That is what the one I'm finding the most helpful here. I don't know about others of you that look at insects. These are all good books. Um, and the, the Cranshaw book is kind of the Bible, but I really, the, the photos and the descriptions and the size descriptions in Peterson's book, I find really, really helpful. And then Bug Guide website is also very helpful. Some people use um, iNaturalist as well, but the Bug Guide website allows you to upload photos and um, they can often help you. There's also, I'm not on Facebook, but there is some sort of insect ID um, site on Facebook that a lot of people use. So if you're on Facebook, you could use that. So these are all books that I recommend, but I would say if you're going to invest in one, the one I would recommend is the Peterson book, which is so popular that it was hard to get for a while, but I think there's plenty of them now. And then my favorite books about insects to read just for pleasure. Um, these are, I think these are all in the library, except for maybe the poetry book. Um, a Buzz in the Meadow and Sting in the Tail by Dave Golson um, are amazing. He's a British man who in Buzz in the Meadow bought a house in uh, a farmhouse in France and with his two little boys explored all the plants and insects around the, it's kind of a dilapidated farmhouse that they fixed up. And then A Sting in the Tail is about bumblebees. He is the founder of the Bumblebee uh, Conservation um, Organization and uh, it's amazing. It's all about bumblebees. Bee Times is about uh, imported European hunting bees, but very, very interesting about their social activity. Buzz, I think you've heard Tor talk about this book and it's amazing too. Buzz, Sting and Bite, I, I mentioned that and it's a fascinating book. Going to Seed and Insects of South Carvallis are poetry and essay books by Charles Goodrich, who's from Oregon. I read a lot of his um, poems at, uh, when I was um, in the leadership of the Garden Club to all of you or to the Garden Club members, their amazing garden poetry and essays. And then a new book, which is a fabulous book, Douglas Tallamy's Nature's Best Hope, which gives all of us some actual concrete ideas about what we can do to conserve insects. So... So here's some, I'm sorry that we had to switch computers. So the um, font is kind of messed up on this. We thought this might happen, but how to contribute to insect conservation, um, the bumblebeeconservation.org and then xerces.org are the ones I would recommend. Xerces has amazing webinars right now. So um, I'd really recommend that you go to their website and have a look. And then you can get a north, uh, list of the Northwest nurseries that sell pesticide-free plants at this site. And L Lorna primarily gets uh, plants from Skagit and it is pesticide-free. And then there's also a way to get more information about the Master Gardener program. And I thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to 
give you these tools. So any more questions? Uh, yes, we had one comment that the army worm is Spodoptera, genus of moths. So that's just an FYI. Thank you. And the question is, I had grayish, brownish bat caterpillars in my fall garden eating everything up to an inch and a half long. Per search in internet, armyworm images came closest. Any idea what it is? I am finding their pupa shells now. If you could, you could send a photo of the caterpillar and their pupa to me. I have a large document on my computer from the federal government that goes through all of the zillion caterpillars and their matching Lepidoptera adults. Um, and I can look and see if I can find it. There are many of them that look very similar. So it is very difficult. And otherwise you have to key them out, which is pretty laborious without the actual insect in hand because you have to count spots, et cetera. So it's, it, you know, it makes it difficult, but I can try and you can just send it to my email, which is in the garden club uh, directory. Um, and I'll try to do it with the, the, the list that I have from the federal um, government. Okay. Um, I just want to share that you are getting a ton of thank yous in the chat. Thank um, you. Great presentation. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. So much information and your enthusiasm is contagious. <laughs> so informative. So thank everyone, you. everyone enjoyed it very much. And I want to say to everyone that um, in the recording, I will duplicate the links that Kate had in her presentation so that they will be clickable in the, um, uh, the description of the YouTube video. Wow. Thanks, Holly. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, everyone. Well, Kate, I, I can't imagine a more fitting end to this difficult year than this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That was just perfect. I, I just want to advertise for upcoming things, if I may, for, for a minute. But thank you so much. Um, I just want to remind you that we're now planning for September. So keep September and um, and October, the second Wednesday, Wednesday is available for you. And then November and December, the, I'm sorry, the other way around. September and October, the third Wednesdays, we hope we're gonna be meeting in person, we'll see. And then the um, second and Wednesday in November and December, we also hope to be meeting in person. And then through January to May, the third Wednesday. So mark those mornings in your calendar to join us. Also, I have a request. We have, we have several speakers already planned, but we would like more. So if you have ideas, uh, please send them to me and I'm easy to find. Just look in the newsletter or on the Orcas Island Garden website um, and, and send me those ideas, um, either for topics or for specific speakers. Thank you. We're looking forward to seeing you all in the at the garden tour. Nita, did you have? Um, no, I don't have anything to add. It's a great program. Um, I had I just noticed there was a chat question saying that once we start meeting in person, uh, hopefully we'll be able to still record programs so people who can't attend at the at the actual time will be able to to uh, view the programs later. We are working on that. We're hoping that that's going to happen. We realize that not all our members can come to a, a Wednesday morning program. Not all our members are actually on Orcus year round. So we're working on that because we realize that that's something that, that many of our members would like. So um, we're, we're, we're hoping that that's gonna be possible. But thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll see you at the garden tour. Thank you, Kate. And um, we'll see you all hopefully next September in person at, at our next season's first meeting. Thank you all. Bye.